Hello everybody, I'm Alberto Massidda and today we are going to talk about teaching machines to read code changes and actually to, pre to tell what happened. So predicting a uh, commit message with neural networks. Just a brief word, uh, I, were, uh, I want to thank my company who sent me here, provided the, all the hardware for the training, for running experiments, uh, providing the time for me to run the experiments. Uh, and we basically are a consulting company completely devoted to open source, which is pretty cool. And we only use open source technology. And uh, we are an Italian based company. We do DevOps, uh, cloud, ML, big data, and lots of interesting stuff. So, why would we want a, a commit message suggestion? And uh, is this presentation actually? Seriously? Well, okay. Why do you want a commit message suggestion? For example, but because we want to, ju to just help uh, the developer, for example. So we want to get, give an ad to the, to the developer. Or for example, we want to catch bad commit messages. Just imagine if your Jenkins pipeline was able to reject pull requests based on the lousy commit message that was attached. I, I think we've all been there, right? So it would be nice if we had an automated way to generate stuff, uh, to use it as similarity metrics and how good a commit message is. What we don't want, anyway, is a message uh, based on templates, because message based on templates uh, just suck. Uh, they can just uh, tell you a very, very narrow uh, cases, uh, and we don't want just a uh, uh, nice crafted message uh, where you fill just names. Instead, we'll really uh, generate the message which pertains the very specific case you're tackling. And we don't want also a message that summarizes what has changed, because what has changed is trivial. This file changed in this way. This is the point of the git patch, the git diff message itself. We, instead, we want a message to capture the high, uh, at least the medium level intents of the coder and why it changed, okay? So it turns out that generating a message for a, commit, uh, for a code change is a problem of summarization. And we want to generalize what was the intent of the coder, at least at a low level, why you did that. And then we, maybe we are not exposed to the high level of the project because you cannot even tell it by looking at the commit history. But we want to know what is changing in that particular context. A change of code is all, always comes with a commit message which describes the full change. So in essence, uh, right, when the developer writes a commit message, uh, it's generating a summary of the changes. And we want to exploit particularly this thing. A uh, diff patch uh, provides a really focused source of code to summary mapping. So in this case, uh, we change only, only this line and we replace with this. And this one is being copied because I want to generalize for multiple items. And uh, so the point of the learning in this case is learning uh, a code to summary mapping. What can we use for that? Neural networks. Neural networks are particularly good at gener uh, generalizing mapping from uh, source to target. And uh, machine translation can actually help a lot because the whole point of the statistical machine translation and later on neural machine translation nowadays uh, is to infer a mapping between languages and by means of uh, counting the co-occurrences of words between two different parallel corpora's uh, or uh, vector embedding manipulation. What I mean is that if we take a sentence and we like map it into a dense vector of float numbers, right? Much like we do with the TF-IDF in information material thing. And we put it into a multi-dimensional space, in a high dimensional space, like 256 dimensions. Concepts that will be really near will be near in this space. And this holds true across different languages. So we can map from a language to another by looking at vectors, at concepts that sits near in the language. So, in order to do uh, machine translation, we need an architecture first and a data set. The architecture that we picked in this case uh, is the Google Neural Machine Translation architecture, which is the state of the art uh, for the machine translation. Uh, basically, this is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence model with attention. We have here the inputs, 
and are fed into a bidirectional uh, recurrent neural network with the uh, LSTM cell in order to prevent the vanishing gradient problem, which is the phenomenon by which uh, the neural network tends to forget what is seen uh, in a state which is far into the computation, and so it's not able to learn. Then we feed this uh, double pass, forward and backward pass, to a stack of eight layers, which uh, have also residual connection. Residual connection is when you just, uh, you not only feed the input of previous layers into the new one, but you also feed the original input uh, and you concatenate it together. This is because it was observed that producing the intermediate representation of a result along with the input uh, helps generalizing better because the gradients, uh, when you are back propagating, flows uh, again, uh, across the, uh, the residual connections uh, and are not uh, uh, hampered, basically. Then you uh, feed everything to an attention model, which is uh, a nice machine that sits in between uh, and helps uh, uh, understanding what is the part of the input that should be used across all the multiple uh, words that you have been feeding in to generate the current state uh, in a decoder. The decoder is the network on the right, which is the run, which is the one which is currently is really generating the sentences. Okay? So this one is getting the context of the diff patch, everything that has changed, the file names changed, the code changed, feeds into a decoder which generates by means of our current neural network, it generates the real words that will be fed. And also this one is a stacked eightfold recurrent neural network with uh, uh, is monotonic, it's not bidirectional, with um, residual connections. And then we, we needed a data set. So we used the Kami data set provided by the Jiang and Macmillan experiment, uh, which this presentation takes inspiration from, which was uh, a research done two years ago about uh, how to extract uh, uh, commit messages from diff patches. They used a totally different technology because uh, they didn't have this at the time, so we are actually uh, using better weapons to tackle the, the same problem. It's two million commits uh, from the top uh, 1,000 Java uh, repositories on GitHub. We extracted only the first sentences uh, from uh, each uh, commit message, so uh, and then we uh, basically stripped away the issuer, the commit hash. Uh, we tokenized everything for, with white space, uh, keeping the candle casing and punctuation because it's part of the language. And then uh, we basically had to cut out everything which was uh, longer than 100 words, being in the diff patch or being in the commit, uh, commit message. And this left us with 75 uh, commits. And then we apply another filter uh, which was described in that experiment uh, of three years ago by John McMillan, which was uh, try only keeping the verb dire object messages. So if I take uh, a bad commit message like uh, blobs of code then fix, I cannot really, f and there's lots of them, I cannot feed it to the, uh, as a training sample because it will pr make my model produce garbage. So the best commit messages are those which begin with a verb, added this file, updated the changelog, uh, I don't know, uh, removed uh, this kind of uh, import, and uh, then there is a direct object after that. So it really is a good message that summarizes. It was a very heuristic uh, way to tell uh, uh, bad commit messages from good one and try to have a kind of unsupervised uh, way to separate uh, uh, bad messages which, which should never be fed uh, as a training example. And so we left uh, with the 30, uh, 32,000 uh, commits uh, split uh, in three different sets. Uh, the biggest for training, uh, then one for validation during, the one, one for testing during uh, the training, and one for validation after training was done to prevent uh, picking. We use the Sokai which is a, a deep learning framework for sequence to sequence, uh, much like tensor to tensor, uh, based on AWS MXNet, which is a really cool uh, framework, by the way, even though it's a really an underdog of the field. Uh, everybody is just in love with PyTorch and TensorFlow. I like MXNet because it's really polished, they're really well uh, designed from, from ground up. And the training happened of uh, AWS itself over Tesla K80, and a Tesla V100, and uh, 
I want to spend a few words about the fact that the new, the new GPU that NVIDIA released is a total beast. And uh, it costs four times as much, but it's four times faster. So they say that uh, the only thing that money can't buy is time. Well, in, in deep learning, this buys you a lot of time. And uh, I, the original experiment was uh, 38 hours uh, training length. I ended up in five hours. So it really let me iterate a lot. And you can see that uh, from the perplexity of the output generated during the training, you can see the model really picked up uh, instantaneously. And there was no overfitting. This is the same graph over logarithmic scale. So you can see the model uh, still has a long way in this uh, apparently flat uh, um, uh, field here. And it's still really pick, picking up. And it stopped by itself uh, after entering that plateau. So the results, five hours later, which is uh, 242 epochs and 43,000 mini batches, uh, are these. And these are actual, actual uh, figures uh, I ripped out uh, from yesterday evening uh, while I was uh, uh, frantically scrapping through my presentation to tweak it. So I removed these two lines. This is the human, the original uh, commit on the validation set, so no peaking here. So remove the no needed imports. The machine translation said remove unused import. So the machine really gener generated that, this message uh, just looking at this one. And uh, in this case, uh, the messages are actually equal. So add the table of contents in Python readme, and the machine said uh, really the same. So this makes me think there's a kind of a repetition uh, pattern in the training data. Uh, the training data was shuffled and was uh, divided. So it should be really, uh, I was really could not believe it like this because uh, I, I thought the machine would have uh, tweaked it a little. And uh, this one is nice. Uh, here we are uh, updating the version of Gradle. And uh, so update Gradle. And the machine said update the build tools version. So, Grad so he knows that Gradle is a build tool. And uh, he understood that I was updating the version actually. Uh, this is my favorite. So version 1 to 2, 3 in the POM file uh, of Maven plugin. Update the OS Maven plugin to fix an issue with IntelliJ IDEA on Windows. Uh, there was no way the machine could actually know that uh, on Windows he, the developer had a problem. And so the machine said, upgrade the OS Maven plugin to fix the build issue. Because if you're fixing the POM file, it means that you have a build issue. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the actual plot uh, of the neurons uh, in the attentional model. So, okay, let me just go through this. Here you can see uh, the patch, the common message. So is everything like this, uh, crammed in just one line, okay? And you can see here the message that was uh, output, upgrade OS, Maven plugin to fix the build issue. It's really crammed because uh, this is a fixed uh, representation graph, uh, and so the, the labels uh, jump one another. And here you can see that by look, these are the neurons uh, who got activated. So whenever you see blank space, uh, you actually are seeing uh, neurons that didn't fire up. So you, uh, it's a, mat a matrix multiplication. So if you m multiply your input uh, in a matrix, uh, you obtain other matrix uh, as an output, uh, or you obtain an uh, output field. And um, so the neurons uh, who actually have the highest score, they have activated, OK? this standard neural network stuff. And the neurons who have a low score actually didn't fire up. This is because there was no matching, uh, like a template, between the input and the output, like the input vector running over the, over the matrix, OK? So here we are plotting uh, the real float numbers uh, as a, uh, is a, in a gray scale. So the highest the numbers, uh, the highest the correlation between this input uh, and this uh, output here. So you can see the upgrade OS Maven actually triggered when he saw artifact ID words and he saw Maven. And here, to fix the build issue, triggered a lot when he, said, when he saw Maven. So Maven is a synonym for build issue, because if you're changing your POM file, it means that you have a serious problem building up. That's what the machine learned, actually. And the graph goes this way, because you start from the first word, which are the top right there, and here. So 
the gradients falls like this. So, uh, was everything actually a success? Well, uh, for those who are not acquainted with machine translation lingo, lingo the, um, the metric that we use in machine translation is uh, called BLE, which is a bilingual evaluation uh, uh, U, I don't remember what it is, but the, the fact is that uh, we actually compare the output of a mach machine translation and a human translation, and we count the engrams, in, the words in common, between the original and this one. Uh, it's, it, it's scaled between uh, 0 uh, and 100. It's actually impossible to get 100 even for a human because it means that you should have written exactly the same thing. So this metric is not very good, but it's a standard, and it tells you that if you have a very low blur score, a low blur score is actually 15, 10, your model sucks. Uh, if you have a high blur score and the fluency starts to uh, popping in at uh, uh, 18, 20, so for example, 26 uh, is a nice blur score, and state of the art, which is Google Translate on fluent language, uh, is 34. The, experiment, the original experiments uh, of the Jiang Macmillan was 33, we obtained 37, because we were armed with a better architecture. <laughs> and uh, this is the um, character engram F score of 40, which is stellar. So precision recall is 40%, which is really, really high. Uh, watch out, if you get a too high blur score, like 70, it means that something is totally wrong because uh, <laughs> you're just copying, you're just feeding the validation input as a training sequence. So you cannot just learn that. So the model has learned fluent English, it outputs perfect English phrases, and it spotted very interesting correlations in short comet pa um, uh, patches. So, okay, you, you talked uh, uh, briefly about uh, history of success. Uh, why do you talk about failure? Well, because then I, I said, okay, we are really using a very constrained uh, data set. Uh, let's just try to remove a lot of constraint and see how it performs of uh, wild comets. Well, Actually, uh, I didn't get the very good results because the error rate for long patches is embarrassing. A lot of sentences, uh, although are good English, are totally incoherent with the input. And that's why the data set is so picked, so well chosen. For example, and I have a lot of these, uh, uh, the human, uh, I won't show you the patch because it doesn't matter, but the human uh, uh, comic was to change the default FBO cache size to zero. Machine add the news and import for no pass. There was no no pass uh, thing anywhere. There was no imports. There was nothing related to that. So why is the reason? And these are the things that got, gets interesting. So you learn the most uh, of the technology when you watch it fail. You know, you look at stack a trace and you know how the dependencies uh, are doing. You see an edge case and you know better your model. So. This turns out to be an extremely difficult task in practice uh, because uh, vanilla machine translation architecture is not tuned for this particular task. So, for example, we have, uh, when you're translating English to French, you have sentences which are kind of uh, uh, same length approximately. So, uh, actually, translating English to French is so easy that is basically not taken uh, in, even into account because it's uh, uh, too much of an easy task. Instead, we shifted towards English to German because uh, the, um, the formation process of the sentences uh, is, much, is very difficult uh, in German, which you are concatenate stuff, uh, respect to English. And, uh, but you have a kind of a growing uh, uh, ratio which makes the sentences not too much in balance. So 30 words against 40 words maybe, or 20 because you concatenate. Instead here, with diff patches and a pitiful commit message, you have an imbalance of, which is tenfold. And this is what leads us to the fact that uh, the decoder is fluent because the output is always within 10 tokens on average, 10 words. So you actually uh, have uh, a recurrent neural network with unfolds 10 times, and he's able to generalize uh, well and to output fluent English. But then you have very poor context performance, so if you output uh, a very fluent English sentence which is totally incoherent with this patch, uh, it means that the encoder network, uh, this one, remember, is not able to condition appropriately the decoder. 
So you are not able to capture any meaningful context uh, to fit with the coder in order to instruct it what, what should be generating. So it generates random uh, fluent words. Uh, so totally uh, gibberish, uh, which looks like very nice English. Uh, but you're, you're not conditioning. Uh, and uh, not even a human can remember a 500 words context. Uh, and this is not about uh, a vanishing gradient uh, problem, uh, because the LSTM uh, is able to prevent that. Uh, but over a 500 length, uh, it cannot just carry out enough context. And the attention model, who just is supposed to link uh, the exact input uh, word to the exact output word, uh, cannot keep up with such uh, lengthy uh, inputs. Uh. And this is uh, our fault, actually, because uh, the diff patch uh, it's too complex. It contains uh, insertions, ablations, context uh, things. Uh, and so we are just uh, cramming together too much stuff. Uh, so this approach uh, uh, with this current architecture is just doomed to uh, take so much further. Also, there are memory problems because if you are unfolding 500 times that are occurring in your network, your memory will explode. So a uh, Google Neural Machine Translation works well. The transformer, which is the state of the art, uh, uh, in uh, sequence to sequence model goes out of memory instantaneously as, l as soon as the training just begins. So I'm proposing here a better architecture. So the main source of chaos stems from the input length and the complexity because we are cramming together insertions, so new lines of coding green, ablations, the red lines that we are removing, and the context, the white lines that's just telling you where you are. It would make much more sense to adopt a multi-encoder network in which we use an encoder for insertion, one for ablation, one for context, and then a hierarchical attention network to tell what, what is the encoder which is not influenced should be actually disregarded, and then just one decoder to funnel out everything outside. Which is much in the spirit of the transformer, actually, because the transformer is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence network which don't use any recurrent neural networks and just uses attention machines with multi-attention heads, eight of them, actually, looking, attending at different parts of the code. And so you have different things, different moving parts, attending to different parts of the input and the output. And that gives it a lot of nice performances. So remember this, which you have a, a very natural way to separate context because you know this is the ablation and this is the insertion. And uh, everything which doesn't have a minus or a plus uh, is just uh, context. So what I propose uh, is that we, we get the very same thing blurred out and we stash the lines pertaining to a context, uh, no matter where they are, into a separate encoder. And the same holds for uh, ablation insertion. We get an attention uh, model in between just to tell what are the relevant parts. And then we feed the, all these three attentions toward a global attention. And that goes into a decoder. The input complexity, the advantage is that it's factored into subparts. The speed is unimpacted because you have the same number of matrix multiplication plus three. And uh, same number, I mean, uh, one for each uh, uh, time you unfold. So if you have a 500 long uh, input, uh, you do 500 at least the matrix multiplication. In, in, rea in reality, there are many more because uh, you mat mul for the input, you mat mul each time you compute a new step, and you mat mul for the output, so three times. Instead, you, since you're factorizing the 500 in 100, 100, 100, uh, it's 300 actually, uh, you have the same number, you only add three and uh, the precision is expected to actually improve a lot better. So instead of a traditional attention where you actually take uh, the source state, you do a dot product attention between uh, all of these. Then you score them between zero and one to say what is the state which is actually um, mo most pertaining to that current state. And then you, mo you sum together all these faded states except for the one which is uh, the most pertaining, and you feed it to the decoder, I'm proposing to doing this. So you take the hidden state H0, you feed into the ablation attention and to insertion attention, for example, and you compute the weight against the ablation. So what are we supposed to get out of the ablation lines, okay? How the current state, how the probability of generating the next English word 
correlates uh, with the lines that were actually deleted. And you do the same for the lines that were inserted. And then you feed uh, the, the two attentions into a global attention vector in which the inputs are not hidden states, uh, but are the summation, the attention output. Uh, and in that global attention, you decide uh, which is the next word that you should be generating uh, based on the fact that you are seeing uh, this uh, ablation context and this insertion context. So no more about uh, current, uh, just one single flat uh, space, uh, no matter uh, if it's ablation or insertion. But you just factor out uh, by hierarchically distributing the complexity. This is to be coded, of course, because it's a proposal and uh, it's a thing that I'm, I like to actually realize. It's not that technically difficult, actually. It's just a novel architecture. And this basically is the end of my presentation. You find everything in my GitHub repository, Agent I, Vanilla Neural Network Comic Suggester. Everything is on the slides. You can download the website. Thanks, everybody, for your attention. If you don't do any question, I will keep telling jokes. <laughs> no questions? Sure, please. Uh, I don't know if it's relevant, but this is not used for vectorial networks, so this kind of problem uh, is used by machines, but it's not used for vectorial networks. Okay, so the question was uh, why, uh, if it was feasible to use uh, generative adversarial networks, uh, which are kind of uh, neural network architecture, in which you have two networks which play a game, one against each other. One tries to generate a nice uh, uh, sentence, and the other one has to detect if it was generated by human or by a, a machine. And uh, so you have a generator and a discriminator which tries not to get fooled by the other. And in the training, they compete to be, the, to be better. And in the end, you have, yes, this is perfectly doable because uh, uh, GANs can be actually used for uh, natural language processing. It will be a novel approach, which will make totally sense to try. Uh, they actually uh, have a very different training scheme because they use reinforcement learning instead of vanilla backpropagation. But yeah, it will be totally a uh, nice thing. Please do. And come here next year to tell us how it's gone. Thanks. Another question? So the question is, uh, uh, is there any publicly available uh, uh, study which tells uh, if there is a computer uh, programming language uh, which is translated, handled best? Uh, there was a, a multi-language corpus in a study uh, was actually about generating uh, um, comments. And they gathered together uh, different uh, uh, corpuses of um, uh, of code, so there were Python, there were JavaScript, uh, and uh, actually the performance uh, uh, was not uh, too, too different. And in that case, it, make, it makes the difference uh, having a very rich corpus, high quality corpus. So, for example, I expect uh, C code to be a uh, very high quality because uh, the kernel messages, the, cur the commits in the kernel, uh, uh, Linux kernel repository, if you do a bad commit message, uh, Linux Torvalds is going to bang your door in person uh, and actually kick you very roughly. And so there is a kind of reign of terror which ensures that uh, people stay in line and don't commit uh, uh, bullshit into the repository. So I just expect that uh, if the project is serious, uh, you will have a nice training data and you will uh, be able to generalize better prediction. Question? If, uh, if, I, uh, if I check it, if the commit messages fit. Uh, please, uh, can you please talk louder because it's very faint from here. Uh, 
Yeah, sure. Here. Uh, the blue score actually was uh, compared. Huh? Okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, so the question is have you tried verifying if the comment messages uh, uh, produced by the human, uh, produced by machine, actually match those? Uh, reverse the. <laughs> so, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> the question is really tricky. So, if I uh, looked at the commit message by human, how they correlate uh, with the actual code changes? <laughs> well, uh, I can use this uh, as a way to try to score the messages computed by humans. But uh, there's the problem that uh, I could get, uh, if I use this kind of metric, uh, for example, which is counts the engrams in commons, uh, so the uh, subsection of char contiguous characters uh, in common of the sentences. Uh, so these two uh, are very different, uh, so these will get a low score, but actually they are pretty good. So uh, it's really difficult to establish uh, a metric uh, to evaluate uh, uh, if the the, mess the original message actually correlated very well to the commit change that you did. The same uh, for this one, update Gradle, uh, this will get a very shitty blur score, also because of the capitalization, the, which is different, uh, so the engram will not fit. Uh, there was another message in which um, there was a typo in the original commit message, so update change log without the N, and the machine output update change log. So actually was able to generalize the correct spelling. That will get another low score. So it's really difficult to uh, correlate uh, the quality of the message because the message usually is a low quality. And that's the whole point of coming out <laughs> with this kind of uh, Rube Goldberg contraption. Yeah, question? Okay, uh, so the question was, uh, uh, since you are actually trying to learn to translate uh, between uh, something that you've seen, right, how can you actually cope with things that you haven't seen? Well, that's the problem of out of vocabulary words. Uh, and neural machine translation suffers a lot from this because it's not able to, gener to generate uh, a float vector of something it hasn't seen. So there, are, uh, there is an effort that is uh, factorizing the words into subwords. Uh, and uh, so that you can cope with engrams. But uh, gener uh, generally, uh, it does a good job because you use, we use frameworks. So there's a lot of stuff which is in common different projects. And this tells us about the nature of software development in which most of the code is not ours, but it's of the framework. And uh, there are conventions, naming conventions, which helps a, li a little. And Otherwise, uh, yeah, you get uh, a rubbish thing which is not able to compute. But most of the times it goes well. And the, blue, the very high low blue score is a very encouraging. Okay, so time's up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, so.